All right, we're just going to break here for a couple minutes and uh, two minutes we'll continue. Oh, actually, we might as well just go into the next one. I'll just do the um, introduction and and we will uh, let her get her slides up here. Caitlin. Hello. Hi. Um, so Caitlin Campbell is a PhD candidate at the University of South Dakota where her research focuses on the effects of agricultural contaminants on amphibian populations. Recently, her work has taken a more interdisciplinary approach to better understand how and to what extent neonicotinoids accumulate in the brain. And Caitlin's um, presentation today is titled, World's Most Popular Insecticide Rapidly Accumulates in Brain and Delays Reaction Time. All right, Caitlin, go okay. ahead. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me today. And I am excited to close out our conference. So over the past century, our country has dramatically changed as a result of increased urbanization and industrialized agriculture. And this has caused an increase in demand for various resources and crops. So to accommodate this, a lot of uh, farmers have actually started to install tile drainage systems, um, particularly in the Midwest. And so what these systems are, are basically perforated pipes below the earth's surface, and this helps remove any excess water from the fields. Um, and so this can prevent the crops from being saturated uh, during your uh, yearly growth. And so this can increase the crop yield and also decrease sediment loss. Um, unfortunately, this can also transport any extra nutrients that were left behind from various fertilizers and also potentially transport uh, more harmful contaminants. So previous work in our lab that was actually done by Drew Davis and Matt Shores, I think they're both on here today, um, has detected over 98 different contaminants in these tile wetland systems. Uh, so this has ranged from various herbicides to fungicides and insecticides. And so my main focus is on neonicotinoids, which are a new type of insecticide, and they're neurotoxic. And they were produced in the 1990s and have since really taken off and become extremely popular amongst farmers. And so a lot of recent work over this past decade has looked at neonicotinoids and found increased concentrations of these contaminants in agriculturally dominant areas. And now this is problematic because it can have effects on a lot of non-target organisms. So you might be thinking, how do neonicotinoids work? Well, imidacloprid is the most popular used type um, throughout the entire world. And that's kind of the focus of today's talk. And so they can be applied in various different ways through seed treatments. Uh, they could be ejected directly into the soil and even sprayed onto young crops. And from there, it will be absorbed by the roots of the plants and travel up the stalk where it reaches its main target, which are sap feeding insects such as aphids. Um, unfortunately, aphids aren't the only uh, creatures that are using these crops. And so it also targets our um, pollinators. And we've seen drastic declines recently um, as use of imidacloprid and other neonicotinoids has increased. Uh, from there, imidacloprid can also build up in the soil. It has a relatively long half-life, so it can stick around for quite some time. Um, and this can then be transported into nearby wetlands and even into our drinking water systems. So if you don't filter your water, I definitely recommend it. Um, I feel like I say that at all of my talks though. Um, other ways that imidacloprid can be transported into nearby wetlands is also through runoff and the tile drains, like I mentioned earlier. And um, also it can be accumulated in like dust and stuff. And so that can go up into the atmosphere and then be deposited into nearby wetlands um, at a later date. And this also, um, I think some people were mentioning about birds and waterfowl. This has a dramatic um, negative impact also on those species. And so when it reaches these wetlands and reaches these other non-target organisms such as fish and tadpoles and even adult amphibians, um, it will then bind to these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are extremely important because they're responsible for neural communication. Uh, so this involves memory and learning and the reward system. So like I said, extremely important. And it's problematic because these neonicotinoids like imidacloprid bind irreversibly to these receptors. So under normal circumstances, acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, 
will come in through here and bind to this receiving neuron and then get broken down by acetylcholinesterase and just get cycled back through. But when imidacloprid is present, it will bind irreversibly and basically fight acetylcholine for these spots. And this will cause a backup of more imidacloprid as, it's, um, as these organs, organisms are continuously exposed to the contaminant. Um, and so acetylcholinesterase cannot break down imidacloprid. So this causes rapid firing and overstimulation at these receiving neurons, which can result in paralysis and death eventually. Um, and so neonicotinoids have been kind of tooted as being less toxic to vertebrates compared to insects. And this is for various reasons, such as insects have more of this particular nicotinic acetylcholine receptor compared to vertebrates, and they also have slightly different configurations. So a little bit of different uh, subunits are at use. Um, but no one has actually ever quantified imidacloprid in a lot of different brains, especially amphibians. There's been a little bit of work done in fish but no one's ever quantified it for frogs. Um, and especially even more so, no one's looked at the breakdown products of imidacloprid, which are oftentimes a lot more toxic than the parent compound itself. And so this has kind of led to my overarching question is, can imidacloprid cross this blood brain barrier in amphibians? And if so, to what extent? And so I previously did a very similar field experiment um, where I just collected some of these frogs from control wetlands so they weren't uh, connected to any tile drains, and then we also collected some from the tile wetlands themselves. And then we quantified imidacloprid in their brains, and I compared them between the two uh, wetland types. And we saw about two to two and a half times more imidacloprid in these tile wetland brains compared to our control. And there was a greater than 93% probability that the tile wetland brains had more imidacloprid. Um, so this kind of just gave me the confidence and uh, really the interest to spend the time and the money because this is, quantifying imidacloprid is expensive, um, unfortunately. So I felt that it was necessary now to go forward with the lab-based experiment. Um, and so to do that, I wanted to look at the changes in growth following various exposures to imidacloprid um, at different concentrations. And then I wanted to quantify the parent compound and its breakdown product, imidacloprid olefin, in northern leopard frog brains. And then lastly, I wanted to determine if um, exposure to imidacloprid could affect feeding response times um, and reaction times in these animals, since, like I said earlier, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are responsible for reward systems, so that can be evolved in food and willingness to eat food. So from there, I collected 50 adult northern leopard frogs from wetland protected areas in eastern South Dakota, and we allowed them to depurate for two weeks to kind of remove any extra toxins that may have been in their system from uh, being exposed in the field. We uh, recorded mass and total length of their bodies at the beginning and end of the experiment and then um, during our weekly redosings of the waters. And so we exposed them to uh, standard analytical grade imidacloprid for 21 days straight at 0 0.1, 1, 5, and 10 micrograms per liter. And I pick these concentrations because they are ecologically relevant. We usually see pretty low concentrations of neonics in the field. Um, so I wanted to kind of represent that, but also get a slightly higher end um, for this dose experiment. We then conducted feeding response trials in which we dropped a single cricket into each container that the frogs were in, and then recorded the amount of time it took for them to consume this frog. Uh, so we stopped doing these recordings after 120 seconds just because you know, there's 50 frogs and that's kind of a long time to be watching them attempt to catch crickets. Um, afterwards, we then removed the whole brains and sent them off to the University of North Dakota where they quantified imidacloprid and imidacloprid olefin for us uh, using liquid chromatography tandem mass spec. And then from there, I ran Bayesian generalized linear mixed models in our studio. And so for the first part of this, um, I wanted to look at the changes in growth. And so on the y-axis, we have difference in body mass, and that's in grams. And so you can see that these are negative numbers. So we did actually have um, all of our treatments, they lost mass over time from the beginning to the end of the experiment. So that's why there's negatives there, just to show that they did lose weight. And then on the x-axis, we have our treatment in micrograms per liter, which are also color-coded um, in our violin plots with overlaid box plots. 
So all of the values from these figures I'll be showing you are all averages pulled out from the posterior distribution of the Bayesian generalized linear mixed models. Um, and then they also have 95% credible intervals. And so there wasn't that big of a difference in how much mass these animals lost between the treatments. Um, there was about a 73% probability that our lowest exposure group didn't lose as much mass as our control. Um, our control group actually lost the most amount of weight overall, but there wasn't really that much of a difference. So then we looked at the changes in uh, body length, so TL, total length, and this is in millimeters on the y-axis. And interestingly enough, our lowest exposure group in the 0.1 microgram per liter treatment group um, they grew the most. They grew over 12 millimeters, which I really wasn't expecting them to grow that much. Um, and there was a greater than 99.99% probability that they grew more than the control group. And then if I bring your attention over to our highest exposure group at 10 micrograms per liter, they grew the least amount. And so there was an 82% probability that they grew less compared to our control. And so this is really a prime example of hormesis in which you have low doses causing high stimulation or beneficial effects. And then at higher doses, you see more negative responses. Um, and so I just found this really interesting. And this kind of shows that there's very variable outcomes based on concentration after exposure to different contaminants. And then we quantified imidacloprid in the brain. And so on the y-axis, we have the imidacloprid brain concentration. Um, and this is in nanograms per milligram of protein in the brain. And so we also quantify protein in the brain to accommodate for any water loss that the brains experience um, after freezing them at negative 80 degrees and also while shipping them to the University of North Dakota um, just to make sure that everything was standardized. And so we saw a uh, linear dose response from increasing the concentration of imidacloprid to how much was actually in their brain. And there was a greater than 99% probability that all of our treatment groups had more imidacloprid in their brain compared to our control. And I was honestly really excited about this um, since this was the first time that anyone has quantified it in amphibian brains. And so this is really definitive proof that imidacloprid does cross this blood brain barrier um, and that this is more of a concern than maybe we were giving it credit in the past and something that we should continue to look at. And so then we looked at the breakdown product because, okay, so maybe we have the parent compound in the brain, but are uh, these contaminants going through biotransformation or are they just being excreted afterwards? Um, so on the y-axis, we once again have imidacloprid olfin, the metabolite of imidacloprid um, and how much is in their brain in nanograms per milligram of protein. And on the x-axis, we still have our treatment groups. And so we still saw a linear dose response in our exposure groups, but, I wanna bring your attention to our control group. So I'm sure it's very obvious. Our control group had more of this breakdown product compared to our lowest exposure group. Um, our control was never exposed to imidacloprid during the course of the experiment. And so the real explanation for this would be that they did have trace amounts in their brain um, while being uh, collected from the field. So there is a baseline amount that they have. Um, and so since they weren't being exposed in the lab, they had that whole 21 days to biotransform the imidacloprid into the breakdown product. So while we weren't actually exposing them, they did already have it in their brain. And so that's why we do see higher concentrations of this breakdown product due to delayed toxicity of imidacloprid. Um, and so there was still a greater than 93% probability that our lowest exposure group was different from our control and a greater than 88% probability that our highest exposure was different from the control. And lastly, we wanted to determine if there were any effects on feeding response and reaction time. So on the y-axis, we have food response time, um, and this is in seconds. And so as the time increases on the y-axis, that actually shows that these animals were getting slower. So that means that it took them even longer to capture these crickets in their containers. And we, so we saw a biphasic response, uh, which is a pretty common response that you see after exposure to contaminants. Um, but I was actually kind of surprised to see that our middle group, our one microgram per liter, was actually the slowest group in comparison to our control. And they were the slowest with a greater than 95% probability that there was a difference. And then if you look at our highest exposure group, they were a little bit faster. Um, and so I'm still kind of looking into the reasons behind this. I have a theory that 
different concentrations could um, alter the way that it's binding or maybe where it's binding. So maybe at lower concentrations, it's specifically binding in certain regions, whereas maybe at higher concentrations, it's spreading out. Um, but this is something I would love to look into further um, and try to figure out exactly what is going on here. And so in conclusion, we found that imidacloprid can in fact cross the blood brain barrier in adult amphibians and that this parent compound imidacloprid is going through biotransformation and being turned into its metabolite, which is more toxic um, to a wide variety of organisms, uh, which is imidacloprid olfin. We saw dose response relationships um, in terms of how much imidacloprid and its breakdown product were in the brain. And we also saw that imidacloprid can reduce growth at higher exposure groups um, and also alter behavior, which is kind of concerning. And so some future work that I would like to look into is how stress affects the blood brain barrier in amphibians. Uh, so we already know that increased stress can increase the permeability of this region. Um, and so I'm interested in looking at various mixtures of contaminants um, and also how these contaminants interact then with various diseases such as chytrid fungus that's been causing a lot of wipeouts and other people have also talked about earlier uh, yesterday. And I'm interested in comparing different age groups. Um, so this is all something that I'm going to be doing this summer and I'm really excited to do uh, even further after my PhD because I only have one field season left, unfortunately. Um, but with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the help I received for this project through my mentors, Dr. Kirby and Dr. Wesner for helping me with Bayesian analysis. Um, the funding that made this process possible, uh, like I said, this, it does get expensive. So I am very grateful for that amount of funding that we got. Uh, chemical analysis done by the University of North Dakota and my two undergraduates, Peyton Keller and Lily Heinzel, who helped a tremendous amount and I could not have done it without them. And with that, I will answer any questions. And we have time, so please go ahead. All right, well, since there aren't any questions, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, and thank you to all the presenters today. In case I forgot to say thank you, uh, I just want to thank you. You all did great. It was such an interesting day today. Well, yesterday was interesting too. So I always love the uh, Wildlife Society meeting because there's always so, so much diverse and interesting um, work going on. And I love to hear about what everybody's doing. Uh, so we're kind of waiting for the open presentations to be uh, judged or evaluated. And so I'm just gonna do a little wrap up stuff here before we um, tell you who won the best student presentation and best open presentation for the meeting. I do hope that everybody that joined in on the meeting this year enjoyed the presentations, enjoyed the lineup. Uh, we tried to focus on things that were topical, um, but also just current research that people are doing. It's, it's really interesting to know what, what everybody's doing out there. Um, the recordings of the presentations will be posted soon. Um, I'll send out an email about that here in the next week, I hope. We'll figure out how we're gonna do that and, and let you know how you can access those. If anybody has any ideas for next year's meeting, please go ahead and send those to me or to anybody else on the board and um, we'll try and build off of those. Oh, and one more thing. Uh, so for next year, if we are in person, start taking your photos now for the photo contest. Uh, remember what 
Jennifer said about the newsletter, if you're doing something interesting or taking some photos out there, just send her that because that's really interesting. Everybody wants to be a part of what's going on in South Dakota. So that would be wonderful if you could share your experiences with everybody. How are we doing, Casey? Does anybody have any questions while we wait or other discussion points? Okay. So I just got the results. After we get done with these, I'm just going to close the meeting. So uh, um, once everybody claps or applauds for, for our best speakers, best presentations, we will be done um, until next year. So the best student presentation um, evaluated by people that were watching the, the presentations was Megan Figura. Congratulations, Megan. We'll be sending you your um, plaque. Yeah, if anybody wants to do the little clap sign for her, that would be great. And then the best open presentation was Roland Kays. And sorry we had to rush you through that, Roland, but you did a great job and um, we appreciated you being here today and sharing your information with us. So again, another round of applause for Roland. And thank you again to all the presenters uh, this year. Couldn't have done it without you. And thanks for the board. Um, and thank you, Casey, for all your assistance. Everybody stay safe out there and we'll see you next year. Thanks, Julie. Great job. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Thanks, Eddie.